Perfect. So what I'm going to do now is I'm going to pull up the presentation for everyone and they can then see um, what we're going to be talking through today, which is strategies to support communication. There are loads of different strategies, so it's going to be a bit of a whistle stop tour. If there's anything you want us to go more into detail with, let me know. Like I say, we've got a parent um, and professional support group at the moment set up on our Facebook page, whereby we're putting videos quite similar to this online, just shorter versions and um, specific to what people need. So we can also do an additional one of those if anyone needs a bit more. Um, equally, do just get in contact with us if you've got any further questions because we can answer them as well. So thank you all for coming today. It's lovely to see so many people wanting to come see um, what we're going to be talking about. So we are talking today about um, strategies to support communication. So what we are um, looking at here is ways that we can support children or adults who've got autism. Um, like I say, there are lots of different things. Lots of things might apply to some children or adults and not others. Um, I do apologise that I work with children, so I will mostly be referencing children when I'm doing talking, but I do obviously mean any person who's got autism, it doesn't matter age-wise, um, because lots of the strategies do just apply. It will just be naturally for my vocabulary just to say the word child. So I do apologise, please don't take any offence to that. And um, so what we're going to do today is talk about communication. Now, with communication, first of all, we need to think about what is communication. There's so many different elements to it. So we've built a communication tree here. And with the communication tree, you can see at the bottom, we've got our roots. That's what we start off with. That's like our foundation skills. So we've got early social communication skills. Now, obviously, this is an area that lots of children or adults struggle with. Um, it can be really tricky, but we have got different strategies to work on supporting and often this sort of area might need support sort of throughout and we might be able to work on the higher up stages, but then also be supporting that at the same time. We've then got play. There's lots of different factors that come into play. We've got symbolic play, pretending that something is something else. Pretend play, pretending that our characters have come to life, giving them little voices, things like that. And pretending that you're something else as well, like a bear, that sort of thing, or a frog. Always really good. Parallel play as well, playing together and turn taking as well can come in there too. Then we've got attention and listening. Now, these things are, like I say, those foundation skills. You have to have these to then be able to do that understanding of language and use of talking. And then later on, our speech sounds we worry about. So we have to have that kind of joint attention to them. They can hear the language around them being used and understand what's going on. Obviously, you can't expect a, a child to understand language if they're not paying attention to it, if they're not listening, if they're not in tune with what you're saying. So that's why we then have lots of different strategies to then help that attention to work, but then also help with understanding. And they, again, come hand in hand. Today, I've tried to separate them out into different areas, but there is lots of crossover. So don't worry if you think, gosh, I thought that was a bit of this instead. So for example, visuals are for attention, understanding and expression. So there's lots of different ways they can be used. Next, we go on to understanding. And we need to firstly be able to understand the language that's being used around us to then be able to know how to use it and what to use. And equally, if we're not gonna use their words, we, know we need to know how we've got to communicate. Why have we got to do that? Understand the whys as well as the hows, and then that hopefully is going to work to help increase communication. We then have words and phrases, which is written on here. This is use of communication. Many individuals that have autism may be using more than one form of communication. Um, I can see on here we've got some parents of children who are nonverbal, some people that work with people who are nonverbal as well. So obviously they are going to be using other techniques and skills other than words and phrases. So don't worry, we use that, call that a kind of total communication approach whereby they might be using other methods to communicate with us. Like I say, that's total communication. So that's using lots of different ones and I'll talk about that in a little bit. And then finally, we have our speech clarity. This is something that develops last. Obviously we need to be focusing on the speech sounds but only once they've got good understanding of language and good use of language. So if they've got really limited range of words, we don't really need to be worrying about the accuracy of what they're saying. Because often people come up to me and they say, oh, they're not saying this right. And you're like, well, I'd love for them to be able to say 30 words, please. And that's going to be more functional to them than perhaps working on their speech sounds. So next, what we're going to do, I've kept the tree on there, so then you can see the tree for reference each time. And I'm just going to talk about each kind of element and then how we can kind of help and use strategies to help communication at that level. So early social communication skills, like I discussed, needs a little bit of help sometimes. So we can do people games and people games are things like peekaboo. 
for example, they add that element of fun and using a to and fro with someone. You've also got things like intensive interaction at this level. So that's when you copy someone, copy their behaviours and um, actions and sometimes noises as well. And then that really helps get you on their level of communication. So that's what can be really useful at that stage. I've used intensive interaction sort of with loads of children I work with. It's really good for rapport building as well. So if you're new working with that person or if you've got, say, a new person coming to visit, that person can be really useful just to say, do you mind just to sit with them and just copy what they're doing? Because that really does sometimes just make them aware and they look at you and think, oh, what are you doing? I'm in charge of what you're doing. And they really like that element of, oh, if I do this, are you going to copy and do that too? You did. And they really love to see that kind of progression as well. Turn taking, so even in play, we want to encourage this, like rolling a ball back and forth. That's turn taking. The whole idea with turn taking is really important because obviously it then links into communication because we tend to take turns. I'm not today where I'm just going to talk at you. Um, and we tend to do, take turns in our talking to discuss things. Anticipation games as well, they can be really good. So doing ready, steady, go games. Anything can be a ready, steady, go game. I've worked with children before where we have them on our lap and go, ready, steady, go, and lift them up like a rocket. Ready, steady, go, tickles. It's really nice. And what's really good about it is you can encourage that kind of eye contact or looking, because um, we tend not to say, look, look at my eyes, because that can be quite intimidating sometimes. So if you can say, look at my face, or wait until they glance at you, then you can do whatever it is. For example, hold the bubble wand up and don't blow it until they look at you or make a noise to go, 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 do it. Because that's really going to then, again, increase that joint attention as well. But it's going to help with that anticipation of there's something really fun to come. The next one we're going to have a look at is going to be attention. So attention. With attention, you've got the Attention Autism Program. I don't know how many people have heard of it, but you've got um, this was made by Gina Davies. It's a brilliant program and it's really great because what the key element of it is, is to pique the interest in learning and make it so irresistible that they can't avoid coming and having a look and having that joint attention skill as well. It uses the bucket and you've also got things like songs in there, which really help to show a distinction of something's going to happen next. You sing a song and then you open the bucket, you sing a song and then it turns over. It's quite useful to kind of lead in a child to that. Um, and it can be really good to kind of indicate when things are finished. It's really good for education as well, so it can be used in nurseries and schools. I tend to recommend it for a lot of children um, because it's really great because you can use any curriculum vocabulary in there and really teach those core elements. Um, like I say, this isn't a training course for that, it's just to kind of highlight that these things exist and I would definitely recommend. I know Junior Davies is doing online training at the minute for that, so it would be worth looking into if it's something that you're interested in. It also teaches some really core cool skills as well of shifting attention. So you've got sustained attention on activity and then it moves on to things like turn taking. And that's really good because then it's like, it's my turn. I've got to step back now and wait for somebody else to have a turn. And that can be a really good skill for a child to develop again, because that links so well in that communication element. And the final element of the Attention Autism Programme has a look at developing the independence with learning and doing an activity. So they first get modelled an activity and then get asked to go and do it on their own. And the idea is they then have to sequence in their mind the activities, how they do it, how the teacher did it. It's got visual supports as well. And um, it can be really good then to get their attention to sustain on something that they're doing, but was on adult agenda initially. Within attention as well, we've got lots of things that are really important, sort of core things that we kind of miss sometimes, like get down on the child's level or the adult's level. Make sure that you're with them wherever they are. If they're on the floor, be with them on the floor because that's really important. And use their name as well to try and get their attention. If they don't respond to their name, that's absolutely fine. What you want to do is not give an instruction until they are focused. Because if a child or someone is in their own world a little bit, we don't want to start talking to them and saying things that are really important until they are ready to listen. So we kind of have to wait a little bit. And that's really important to them. Make sure you repeat as well if you did perhaps give an instruction before they were ready to listen. So that's our attention autism bit. Um, next, we've got first and then boards. So I use first and then. There is also now a next. They are the same thing. It's just different vocabulary. I use first and then because I feel like that's a little bit more 
related to the language that I would use in my everyday. So I would say first this, then that. So an example I've got in my whiteboard here is first book and then bubbles. The idea is that your then activity, the bubbles, is something really, really fun that they want to do. And yes, they've got to get through the book, but the bubbles are coming. Initially, you want to start off doing this, but with really, really early phase and really, really quick. So something that's going to be super quick, so maybe a page in a book. And then move on, bubbles, wow, you did it. And make it really positive. Um, the idea with having this as well is that some children might forget what the next thing was. And they're like, oh, why am I sitting here doing this? And they forgot that the bubbles are coming. So it's really useful to act as a reminder as well. Because I've worked with a child um, previously who struggles to get in the car, but loves swimming. And they have to drive to swimming because it's so far. But they got so frustrated that they, even though they could understand the language that was being used and that had been told first car, then swimming, they couldn't remember that swimming was coming. So we used the visual on the back of the parents' car seat so they could sit and look at it. And that really did help them just to remember, oh yeah, that's where we're going. You can use for this visuals as in whiteboards. I use a whiteboard just because it's really super easy to rub out. I've also got um, symbols ready, but obviously you can't always be super duper prepared. So don't worry too much if you can't be. And um, what's really important is once you've done your first activity to cross it out. So then they can then visually really, really see that this is the then activity that you're going to be moving on to. Okay. Next one is visuals to support. So we want to be doing things like using a visual timetable, um, similar to the first and then, but it's a little bit longer. So what I would do is use first and then first, and if a child can or adult can access that and can um, understand it, you can do first, next, and then, which is your next bit. So then you've got three things. And again, you want to try and keep that then thing, something motivating that's gonna be fun for them. And then if they can then cope with that, you can then start to do things like a half a day visual timetable. I tend to say half a day because it's quite a lot of information that could go into half a day. Um, and what's really important when you're using visuals to support as well is to make sure you've got a surprise symbol or they're used to a surprise. Now the surprise doesn't always have to be something bad, but it does prepare them for something they're not used to. So for example, a fire alarm is a bad surprise for most people, but it's something that's unavoidable. I sometimes teach surprise and I would get out a really fun toy or game or something that I know they really love. So I'd stick it between my first and then go, oh, surprise, we're going to do this. And it just helps them to get kind of used to that in a positive way before the negatives then come in. Because obviously that surprise element can sometimes be a little bit unsettling. Okay. Let's make a deal is kind of one of the final things about attention that I'm going to discuss today. So that's a program that has been built by the PEX team which is Picture Exchange Communication System. Um, the Pyramid UK create that. It's um, visual cards, I'll just bring them up on here. So it says like I'm working for, so that first one you would pick, put in that square, you would put a symbol like bubbles, for example, if that's what's gonna get them motivated. So you would say, um, you're working for the bubbles, you need to get a counter. So for example, first we need to build this tower, put one block on, there's a counter. If you're doing a writing activity, it'd be first roll this and then you can have the counter. Great job. And then they can really visually see um, the reinforcement of what they're working towards and how many more they've kind of got to do as well. And what you can do as children get older, you can sort of have a little bit of a discussion about how many things they think they've got to do. So you can say, oh, do you want to do four or five today before you get the bubbles, for example? And it can then be extended to do harder and longer activities as well. It can be quite nice as well because it's got such a good visual there. So it can be a really great thing. Um, you can also tie it in with other approaches like the teacher approach, for example, which I'm going to discuss soon, um, because then you can have in the kind of packet of activities, you can have the counter. So when they're finished, they can pull that counter out and use it. So next, we're going to move on to having a look about comprehension. So that's understanding of language. So it's really important when we're talking to someone with autism that we know their language level, what they understand. It can be really tricky to gauge that, but what you need to do is have an assessment normally by a speech therapist who can then gauge where a child's understanding is at. Because then it's really important if a child's understanding two words that we're not saying to the child, right, go get your blue shoes and your book bag and I want you to get your hat. Because that's five words we're expecting them to try and understand and remember. 
So we need to make sure we're reducing our language to the right level. It's not just to do with the amount of words, it's also to do with some other things which I'm going to discuss soon, including blank marks. So visuals, and I put a little star here because visuals, when they're used for comprehension, they're used for our purposes. So we would use visuals to help with teaching things like that we would make things like mind maps things like that really good clear visuals to help them to understand what we want things like a visual timetable can also be used for understanding what we've got to do in activity something like a task plan for older children is used for understanding what they've got to do and that's for us to communicate with them Visuals can be used in another way, like a textbook, for example. That's them communicating with us. That's not the, us checking their understanding. I would never say to a child, find that one, because the textbook is about them communicating to us what they want. Whereas this side is comprehension, so it's about us teaching them. Oh, sorry, with visuals as well, we've also got things like weight symbols. So like this one here, I use this one quite regularly with children. Again, I build it up really slowly. So I've done this with turn taking, just wait for your turn. Children are quite impulsive, just wait and build it up second by second, getting to 5, 10 seconds, 15, 20, that sort of thing. And then gradually reducing down the need for the symbol, because obviously the use of a visual is fantastic. But we could don't always have one on us. So we want to be able to start to use as well when we when we are out and about. So that can be really handy. And um, I've also used this as well when children are in danger. So if they're going to cross a road, I would pull this one out and go, wait. Equally, I use a no thank you symbol, which is similar to just find one. Similar to that one. So that would be used for me for understanding. So that's a no thank you. If a child's in immediate danger and they're going to do something that's going to harm themselves, such as open the front door and perhaps run out onto the road, I would quickly grab that, stand in front of them and say, no thank you. Or if they're going to throw something really heavy and hard, no thank you, show it to them. Have one in your pocket, have one everywhere. So they yeah, are fantastic. They're giving that visual reinforcement of what you're telling them. Next, we're going to discuss the teach approach. So this is a um, effective and integrated approach to helping individuals with autism. It's an evidence based program and it starts off with five key principles, which is the physical structure, which refers to the immediate surroundings. What you want to do is have a really clear space for them to work in um, and it's defined by those physical boundaries. So they've got a table, they've got a corner, a space that they work in and they know that's where they're going to be doing their activities that they've got to do for learning. The second key principle they talk about is having a consistent schedule. So it's possible through various mediums, like I said, using a visual timetable, you can use photos, drawings, um, symbols, you can use whatever's going to work. Um, you do need to check the symbolic understanding of a child, which the speech therapist who's been to see should be able to tell you. Um, and if not, have a look through with them um, because there's different stages. So, for example, a line drawing can be quite tricky to understand. So sometimes we do need photos to make it more realistic. The third principle they talk about is um, the work system. So that establishes expectations of an activity of measurements. And it also helps promote that independence. How they tend to do this is they have activities in um, wallets and then you've got all the activities in there. So it's defined by what's within. So you don't expect them to do more. You wouldn't get more resources out. It would just be what you've got in that pack is what they're expected to do there. The fourth one is routine and it's essential because it's the most important um, functional support for that child. And then you've got the fifth, which is visual structure. So this they tend to do um, green boxes and red boxes. So your green boxes is what you've got to do. Your red's what's finished. So then you can pop it in the finished one once they've done. The next area of understanding we're going to have a look at today is having a look at blank level questions. So blank level questions were made by Dr. Blank. Um, this is a way to structure sentences. Is that looking at levels of understanding? So there's levels one to four. Four is the most difficult level. Often children or adults with autism do really struggle with blank level three and four. That's quite a generalization, but often they do. And um, so they've got different levels there. And it's about thinking about what language level we're using as well. So blank level one is naming. So it's thinking about what's this? Um, can you say this? What do you hear? What did you do? That sort of thing. If your child's nonverbal, they can still respond to things like this if they understand it um, by finding it, by pointing to it, things like that. Blank level two is called describing. 
So what happened, what size is it, what shape, what colour? Again, if you've got a non-verbal child, they can still do that. They can demonstrate that to you. So they're highly motivated enough to because you've got pecs, which can start to use attributes as well. Blank level three has a think about how are things the same? How are they different? Um, it's about identifying things. Tell me a story, pop some pictures in an order and tell me what's happening. Um, find what one we use for this. So what do I need to brush my teeth, for example? And that's quite useful. And I also use it when I've got different objects. I'd have a toothbrush and I'd say, can you find me what else I need? And I'd have, say, toothpaste, a flannel. I might have out a fork um, and a plate. And I might say, what else do I need for this? And then they can help match it for me. And then again, not needing to use their verbal language. Blank level four is predicting. So what's going to happen next? Again, you can use this as sequencing pictures. You can add in the final one. What, which one do you think is going to happen? You can have two options available. Um, that's often quite funny. Children love to do that sort of thing, make up a story on what's going to happen next. It's also thinking about problem solving. So um, why has this happened? The why question is often a really tricky one. And I often think about when we're talking about why, we could bring it down and make it much easier by saying what happened. So if you say why, let's say, why is Lucy crying? And your child doesn't understand that question why, we could then say, what happened to Lucy? Because that's really going to bring that question structure down, but they're probably going to be able to respond a bit easier. Non-literal understanding as well is a really key part. So often um, people can struggle with some non-literal language we use, and we do use a lot of it. We use a lot of sort of sayings, um, including things like idioms. They are things like it's raining cats and dogs, pull your socks up, that sort of thing. Um, it can be really hard for people to understand because it's not concrete and it really doesn't make much sense. Um, so there are lots of different resources that can help with that. I've got some little packs of idioms. So this is a super duper pack of idioms and um, that sort of thing that I use to teach um, these and I teach it in a really structured way. So first of all, we'd find a card we'd have a look at it. We'd have a chat about what? Do you think's going on this picture? Why does it say this? And then I draw it down with them and I've got a template um, from Twinkle, which I use, which is lovely. And it talks about what the literal meaning is. It's raining cats and dogs, are cats and dogs falling out of the sky? And then what it actually means. And then it talks about as well, putting that into a sentence to then help them understand it. And again, doing that in a visual way can be really good because then they can go back and recap it. Because sometimes generalizing sort of those sorts of knowledge can be quite tricky. So it can be really useful in that element as well. Emotions is our next one. So having a think about um, zones of regulation can be a really nice way. I've got a visual here. So this is zones of regulation. It talks about different colours and putting zones and um, emotions into different colours. I really like it because it doesn't say you can't be cross. It just acknowledges when you are cross, this is how you identify it. You tell me you're in red or we'll put you in red and it's OK. It's OK to be in red because everyone's allowed to feel certain ways. But then it's also about having a toolbox of different things that when this person's in red, this really helps, like a beanbag really helps. And this is when something like a sensory occupational therapy assessment can come in really handy to know what sensory things might help that person at certain times. Equally, if they're really, really excited and they're bouncing off the walls. We know they're in yellow, but they're probably not going to be able to do their work. So they might need to go and do some jumping first to get it out and then be able to come back in and focus. And it's about accepting and acknowledging where they are and then what they can do safely to express that emotion. Because often it's not about saying you can't be like this. It's about how safely can you show us that you feel like this? And this is a really, really tricky concept to understand. So often with children, I'm ending up showing them where I think they are. And we'll do lots and lots of modelling of it as well. So perhaps if I feel a bit sad, I'll, I'll show them I'm, I'm sad, I'm in blue, I'm sad. And we'll talk about it in play as well, because that's a really important element to try and bring it in and develop that understanding first before we then expect them to start using something like that. So the next one we're going to talk about is expression of language. So expression, we've got things like choice boards on here. So I've got a choice board just here, which has got, it's for a puzzle. So it's got on the top, I want, it's got more and it's got finished. This would be for a child or an adult who's going to be pointing to things to tell us what they want. 
I would use this in a set activity because then you've got those choices. I would use it, say, at snack time as well. If you've got set choices that you've got available, make sure you've got them out and they can point. Um, it can be really good for those verbal children as well. I've worked with some children previously who um, perhaps were saying single words and we were trying to expand it. They knew they had to, so we didn't necessarily need to use the PEX approach to teach that initiation, but they just needed that modelling. So if we use those choice boards, that can really help with that modelling there. Signing to support expression as well. And obviously signing can be used as well in understanding. If we use a sign, it can really be a visual. By having a visual, you've got something else to hold on to. Whereas if I just give you an instruction verbally, it's gone the kind of the second I've said it. And if you're not focused, that can be really tricky. Whereas most, some children that I work with can be real visual learners. So having a sign, for example, want, want can be really useful for them to go and then they know oh i've got to use that one bit first want bubbles fantastic and then that kind of can help them to, again to expand what they're saying and it kind of encourage that communication to come forward as well leading in so often some children can struggle with questions being directed at them because it's a lot to process so if i said what's this <gasps> panic question it's tricky i'm not too sure um maybe i'm not listening whereas if i say oh, it's a that can be a really nice way to lead it in if i'm holding it up going oh, it's a bubble yeah bubble then that's really lovely it's taken off that pressure i've done it before with other people when we do things like color what's the color hmm color is and then they say oh red yellow green fantastic you can also offer um, choices as well in there. So what I would do is hold two choices up and say, do you want puzzle or bubbles? Again, it encourages that communication. And um, that's what we're hoping to do is encourage as much communication as possible. It needs to be motivating. So pick two things that you know they're either going to really want or one thing that you know they're really going to want and one thing not so much. Because then we know we're at least going to get that communication for the thing they do want rather than them just perhaps getting it out of the cupboard themselves. Um, and it is about creating those different opportunities as well for communication. So we want to create as many different opportunities as we can to allow that kind of communication opportunity to open up. So that's leading in. And then we've got PECS as well. So PECS, as I said earlier, is a picture exchange communication system. It is, um, I've got a book here, which looks like that. I've also got my book here. It's a way of using um, symbols to communicate. It does not stop verbal communication. If anything, it encourages it to come along. Um, the evidence behind that is quite strong, so that's good. Um, it can be really nice because it gives children a functional way of communicating as well, because perhaps if their verbal communication hasn't come yet or isn't looking like it's gonna come, it can be really frustrating for them not having a way of communicating. And what it does, it teaches them, you need to give me a symbol to then get something in return. And the, what we tend to do is we don't give them any social praise. We don't say, well done, good boy, good girl, none of that. We just give them the item. So then they learn that they're exchanging and they're getting a really cool item in return. And hopefully that'll teach them that in time, if they exchange a word, that will then get them what they want. And again, helping to reduce that frustration is really key. Um, so that's what we do with PECS. There's loads of different stages as well. Again, they've got their own training system. They're doing it online too, this, um, these times. Um, it works on not just single symbols, it can build up to phrases. So a sentence strip here that says, I want bubbles. You can also add colors in there. So I've done it before with um, attributes like colors or size, things like that, big or little. Um, colours of things, so do you want the green slime, the red slime, perhaps if one colour is particularly motivating for that child, they'll really like it. Um, and then it adds that kind of element. And you can also work on, like there, they've got in the middle, I see. So I see is a key one because I see is them starting to comment as well as just asking for things. So it's paying attention to what's going around them and commenting. You can also do I hear on there. You can see as well, they've got a help symbol on there, which is lovely to encourage a child just to say, I need some help with this. This is a really nice system as well, and it can be used alongside verbal. It doesn't have to just be used as a single tool. Like I said, that total communication of using everything to help can be really important. And it's really good to try and encourage that as well. 
We also um, have on there a break symbol, and that's really important. And what I tend to do with children, if they're not yet able to ask us for a break, would be to show them the break symbol to say, oh, I think you need a break. And then encouraging them to then take a break, let's do something different. Because what you're then going to do is start building up that understanding that, yes, I can ask for a break when things start to get a bit too much. And that's OK. And equally, you're going to show me this is how I do it. And then you can then start to do it with the PEX way as well, doing a bit of hand over hand as well. Then we've got our social sort of um, skills. This is the more advanced social skills, so not things like turn taking and paying attention, that sort of thing, looking. It's sort of the more advanced when we get to sort of our verbal teenage years or verbal sort of school age. It can be a really complex world out there. So, and this can sometimes be some things that people need some support with when it comes to sort of the advanced social skills element. So we've got things like social stories. Now, social stories, and the next one I'm gonna talk about as well, created by a lady called Carol Gray. Our social stories were made in 1991 and they are still being used today. So they are really important and really good as well for helping children understand um, a particular situation, event or activity, and it includes sort of specific information about what to expect and why as well. And it's really important because it can be used in so many different ways. So social stories can be used to develop self-care skills. So how to clean your teeth, talks about the routine, uses visuals and keywords as well to talk about what they've got to do and in what order. Talks about social skills, so like asking for help, saying thank you, perhaps um, requesting something from someone. It can be used to help someone understand how um, might they might should behave and respond as well to a situation and sort of variables that could come into a situation as well. So, for example, I've done one before about break time. So if it's sunny at break time, we get to go outside. If it's wet, we might have to either stay indoors or we can go outside, but we need our coat, wellies, etc. on. And it's then having that social story and having that sort of stuck by the door. Then when children are really um, motivated perhaps to go outside but it's pouring with rain and they don't like wearing their coat you've got the story to back you up and say well this is we need it on and it's really good these because they can be made at any sort of level as well so I said this is more advanced you can make this at a really basic level so outside you need your coat just a picture of outside and coat can be used it also helps others to understand the perspective of an autistic person and why they may respond or behave in a particular way. So it can be used as well with peers. It's really useful to talk about what, why is this happening? Why, why do they like to do this, for example? Which can be a really nice way to open up that sort of communication as well. It can help a person to cope with change um, to routine or a, or a unexpected or distressing event. So, for example, the absence of a teacher. If you did a social story prior to that happening, talk about how teachers get poorly sometimes and sometimes they just can't come to school. And then that can be used. I helped a school set some social stories up at the start of um, April when all the, all the children weren't able to come to school so lots of children that I support were really confused about that and you can completely understand why their routine had completely changed we meant to go to school every day and now we're not allowed to go anywhere we kind of had to think about that how can we help these children to understand that and this is one of the easiest ways and obviously having it printed out on paper can be a really good vision as well can be really good as well to provide the positive feedback to a person but an area of strength or achievement so if they've done something really good like yes you put your coat on you really didn't like that but you did it you can look at it and go yes you did that let's go and that can be a really nice way and it can be used as well as behavior strategy so what to do when you're angry how to cope with things what to do safely that sort of thing another area to support that social side of things as well is comic strip conversations I've got a little visual there. So what we tend to do with these is it's a really simple visualised um, representation of different communication in a conversation. So thinking about an event that's already happened or might happen in the future. And it's thinking about what people did, what they thought and what they said. So this one's thinking about there, the child saying to them, you spelled this word wrong. And they're thinking, I really want to help this teacher. The teacher's thinking, my goodness, can they stop telling me that I'm doing everything wrong? And that child doesn't really understand that. That teacher might feel really sad that day. And I've taken that to heart. 
And that child won't know that necessarily. So doing this sort of thing can really help them. And for example, a child as well, not knowing why children are acting certain ways can be used in a sort of comic strip conversation. I've had it before where I've done these with a sort of older child, I think they're about eight, nine, having lots of sibling arguments and fights. We were talking about what do you think your sibling wants to do? And what do you want to do? And what do they think? What do they feel? And it's really good because then you've got that visual. We drew it down together, put it on a bit of paper, and then we're able to review it later. Again, having that recapping can be really useful. Um, and it just helps our sort of understanding to generalise as well. So they're really good because they use sort of stick figures because I am absolutely rubbish at drawing. So I don't know about anybody else. But children, they don't tend to mind either to adults. If your drawings are rubbish, equally they can draw it. So that adds a bit of ownership to it. If they enjoy that drawing element, they can use that to help. And it can be really good as well to sort of display to them that they did do something right if they worry that they didn't. And they can also show them that perhaps next time they could do something a bit different and help them kind of come up with some ideas themselves of what they could do different. Um, for example, telling a teacher someone's done something wrong rather than telling that child themselves and then getting sort of told off because they've told someone else off. Um, and it can be really good to help recognise the feelings of others as well, which sometimes children can struggle with that sort of theory of mind. How are people thinking? How are they feeling? It can kind of dig a bit deeper into those kind of areas. So you can use different colours as well to indicate different emotions. Um, and it helps really to dig deep about what did actually happen. So you can go into lots of detail of what happened, where were you, what time was it, all the rest of those sorts of things, just to add those specificities into there that the child might need. So that's an absolute whistle stop tour. We've now got some time for some questions. So I believe my wonderful assistant is going to start sharing some questions with me that have gone through the chat box. If anyone does have any questions, please do feel free to ping them into the chat box for me. Um, I'm going to stop sharing this one for a second just so I can get the chat box up myself and then I can see if I can answer your questions. Hi there, Sophie. Hi, Ben. Hi, yeah. Um, just haven't had any questions in the chat just yet. Mm -hmm. uh, I think they were all busy watching your um, presentation. Beautiful. That's fine. I had a lot of things to say. So if anyone does have any sort of questions on anything that came up or you'd like a bit more detail, please do let me know. Um, like I said earlier, there is um, we have got a parent support group on our MTW speech and language therapy page. If you go onto our Facebook, there is a support group for parents or anybody that supports anybody with communication difficulties. And um, we've set that up so then parents can kind of interact together. We have two therapists moderating that as well. And we're currently putting up lots of different videos and ideas as well. So hopefully if there's anything that you think I'd like a bit more on this, you can access it that way as well. Good. Well, I'm glad. It looks like we had a really lovely mix of people here today. So thank you everyone for coming. And thank you so much for helping hands as well for setting this up. It's really nice to be able to come and sort of offer this to everybody. So then everyone can kind of get a little bit more knowledge. Thank you very much, everyone. If you've got any feedback and you'd like to share that with Helping Hands, please do. Equally, if you'd like to put a review on our um, MTW Speech and Language Therapy Facebook page, that would be much appreciated as well. And um, it's just nice to know if you've enjoyed it. I don't know if you've seen that one, but um, Liam has popped in the chat a um, question about he works with students uh -huh. and um, is there much support in terms of managing communication for older people? Yeah absolutely so you've got those kind of programs like um, social stories you've got those which can be used to help those sort of older children or adults if you like and um, you've also got things like EHCPs they can be accessed up to the age of 25 I believe so if a, if a person does have some specific area of need, they can be applied for that way. And then you can do things like have a speech and language therapy assessment. If there is need for social skills support at the minute in Norfolk, I believe there isn't funding for that through sort of the um, mainstream accessing route. So you do sometimes need an EHCP in place to be able to access a bit more further support with that.
Okay, so I can see Rebecca's asked, what best techniques would you recommend for young people? How young are you thinking there, Rebecca? Okay, so 11 to 25, again, you'd be thinking those sort of, depends on their ability level. So if they're verbal and sort of struggling with the world around them, I'd be thinking those higher level, blank level questions. Be thinking about those social stories, those comic strip conversations, things like that. Those are often used for children that have um, sort of anxiety as well as ASD, because those two kind of playing together can sometimes cause a lot of um, sort of miscommunications and misunderstandings. Um, if they're sort of lower level and struggling sort of with verbal and stuff, I'd use all those kind of visual supports that we talked about. So, you know, using um, timetables, um, really set routines, task plans can be useful. Um, the Elklan book for um, verbal ASD children as well can be really useful for giving lots of different tips about that as well. So that can be useful for that age range, thinking about if they're at that ability level of being a bit verbal, but needing a bit more support, that can be fantastic. So I'd recommend that. I think it's a purple one and they're normally accessible online. Absolutely. I'll put a link in the chat now if I can just find it. Um, to our MTW speech and language therapy group. Um, you have to go on the main page, I believe. And then, so this is our link for our speech therapy support. It is available for anyone. Please don't worry if you don't have to be local. Um, just be willing um, to answer the questions in there because we're just asking that it's a safe space for everyone. So we just ask that everyone sort of responds to those um, questions when they first enter, just to agree that, you know, you're going to be supportive and just to give us a bit of detail as well about who you are. And it's really useful as well as if you interact on there. So that's gone on there. Uh, oh. What oh, are, so it's someone that works in the museum that would like ideas, not knowing who people are and that sort of thing. And um, what I would do is I would always have sort of visual supports available. So pictures of what they're, they're talking about, pictures of where things are from, that sort of thing. So if you've got, um, let's say, I don't know, we've got a bones from an animal, I would have a picture of that animal available to then be able to talk to them about this is that animal, that's his nose, that sort of thing. And be able to sort of then use that visual to go off as well because sometimes some of those abstract things like this was this can be really tricky whereas if they've got more context that can kind of add a bit of understanding Perfect. So, so someone said, is there any link similar to what educational psychologists do? E.g., do they they also administer assessment and similar to what you do in speech and language? So, what we do is we do sort of a comprehensive assessment of all of the kind of areas I talked about today. It's quite tricky and um, sometimes we need more than one session to do it um, and sometimes talking to you guys as parents, carers, support staff, whoever you are, can be really beneficial for us to get a really better understanding of that child because obviously if we see a snippet of their lives it can be really tricky to get that. Um, we do use formal assessments and mostly informal because that's the best tool so observations can be really useful for us um, and then what we try and do is set as functional targets as possible. I'm currently working at the minute with um, a psychologist company in Norfolk who are fantastic for offering that support so I've been going out to high schools recently to support um, children with SRBs and things like that. We work together hand in hand so then we're setting targets that are functional, useful and going to be helpful for that child for their life going forward. So. That's what we do, sort of a speech therapist. Hi there. Um, I've just realised the time, so um, sort of <laughs> it's got away with us. Um, but yes, if I say sort of five minutes from now, if we can. Yeah, that's yeah. not a problem at all. I've just I've popped a link in for everyone to our group page, and also then I've just popped another one in just for our general MTW page. 
um, just in case anyone wants to pop on there. Like I say, feel free to ping us a message on there on the messenger chat, that sort of thing. Um, or equally, if you've got any further questions, you can ping them to Helping Hands and they'll pass it straight on to us. Is that all right, Ben? They also, obviously, when the Zoom meeting ends um, mm -hmm. shortly, then you won't be able to see the chat anymore. But the links are also, if you go into the marketplace, they are in there as well. Oh, Where okay. we've got all the links. <laughs> Fantastic. That's perfect, Ben. Thank you, Ben. No, it's been a great, great... Um, session sorry <laughs> you're fine thank you everyone. i really enjoyed it good i'm really i'm glad it was useful in some way to some people like i say if there's anything else it's such a big area to cover you know i've done a three degree to get here and then years of experience to sort of have all this bank of knowledge so i don't expect everyone to be able to take it in straight away and if there's anything extra please do just let me know because we can try and cover other bits we're always happy to help and try and support as much as we can and even though we're a free um, a private company, we do tend to do lots of stuff for free, like today, to try and help that wider community. So, yeah, please do feel free. Thank you for um, being with us today. No worries at all, Ben. It's my second year on the trot now, so I'm getting a little bit more used to it, but the Zoom stuff was a bit terrifying, so I'm glad everyone's writing some positive comments in there, so thank you. definitely been a different kind of a year <laughs> absolutely <laughs> yeah. right i think i think that's all think the questions done. yeah that seems to be it beautiful so if everyone wants to just take a copy of those links and like ben said they'll be on the marketplace as well if you just go to the uh, marketplace which is on the main page we have that's links to all of our like people that are doing the sessions today thank you ben Yes. Well, Beautiful. thank you again, and thank you everyone in um, that came, and yeah. we hope to see you again soon. <laughs> yes. Thank you ever so much, Ben. That's brilliant. All right. Well, thank you, everyone. Lovely to meet everyone virtually, and good luck with everyone in the future. And to you too. Thank, thank you. you. Bye. Bye.